a last minute thought. Uh, thank you, Dean Rutherford. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it gives me just such great pleasure to see so many old and new friends and to see so much interest in women and leadership. So as you see, women leaders and best friends. Uh, the topic came to me by way of uh, Dr. Deborah Baldwin, who has been a colleague as a history professor and archival researcher, and sometimes as my boss, and sometimes as you know the the, the czar of the archives that we have uh, available down here uh, in the Butler Center, uh, and so it's especially uh, wonderful for me to. Uh, share a little bit about what archival research does and how we know what we know and the kinds of questions we can answer. And I want to thank again the Arkansas Women's Leadership Forum for all the work they do and for, for inviting me to be part of their program this evening. I am going to endeavor to use the clicker. So let's start with what we know about leadership. Leadership is hard for everyone, and especially for U.S. presidents, and as we come to study first ladies more and more, it's also hard for first ladies. We also know that women in leadership positions face additional challenges due to their gender, due to all sorts of expectations about how women should lead. Uh, and so, Leadership is hard. Effective, decisive, uplifting, empowering, transformative leadership is really hard to perform when one is constantly criticized for all the things that, that with which we're familiar. Uh, Presidents have had important relationships with friends. We can think about Harry Truman and the kitchen cabinet. We can think about you know, comfortable cronies with whom the president can relax and just enjoy the normal interactions of life. Uh, we can think about President Eisenhower and his regular stag dinners with trusted buddies that I learned about when I was doing some research at, on Mamie at the Eisenhower Library. They were often in the schedule, stag dinner, normalizing after the end of the day. And relationships between presidents and such longtime friends as Jimmy Carter and Burt Lance, uh, and of course, all the close friends of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, and you know their names, some of them are here tonight, and I dare not name them uh, lest I omit someone. So we'll just know, you know who they are. Now for women, particularly the first ladies I've been studying, uh, and I'd mention Mamie Eisenhower and her Denver friends. For her, it was difficult to be in the, in the White House for a number of reasons, and she would often leave Washington and spend a week or so in Denver with her longtime friends and come back renewed and reassured. Uh, and thinking about cronies who uh, do not transgress friendship by leaking or speaking to the press or uh, spreading what really is a private relationship. For some first ladies, the key friend is the president, certainly for Jimmy and Rosalind Carter. You could not find, I mean, those are lifelong best friends. And similarly for the Clintons, lifelong brain friends, policy friends, dear friends. Um, and. Uh, Among Hillary's friends, I single out Diane Blair because her records, including transcripts she would write after having a phone conversation, um, note cards she received from Hillary, faxes she sent Hillary, photos, uh, there's just so much material that documents the elements of the friendship and how friends support each other. But I realize that you probably know Hillary Clinton. You may have also known Diane Kincaid, Kincaid Blair. And so on your tables, and also uh, for persons not at a table, 
I am just going to ask you to circulate cards because you, you can help me. In just a moment, I'm going to tell you how. So one of the things, back to leadership is hard. Leadership is hard. Look at the before and after picture. <laughs> Look at the before and after picture. Interestingly, first ladies do not show so much wear on the outside. Now it may be, thanks to makeup, our stylist, our colorist, uh, we manage the aging process. Uh, and look, so here we have, you know, Clinton, the Clintons and the Bushes, let's look at Laura. Her inauguration, her exit from the White House. I chose these photos to give you a bookend, coming into the inauguration, leaving the White House for the last time. So it's a, it's a, fair, it's a fair comparison. So, how can you help me? I want to know about both sides of the relationship. What support First Ladies need and what support uh, a First Lady's friends can provide and how uh, being a friend, so this is the other side, being a friend can help a First Lady survive, persist, thrive in office in Washington. First ladies are targets of so much unkind criticism. Not just political satire, but unkind criticism uh, on cartoons, websites, editorials, and of course most recently in tweets. And this is a long-standing problem for first ladies. We can go back to Abigail Adams, too Republican, uh, or too continental in the way she hostessed and arranged the White House. Um, criticisms of Edith Wilson for usurping the president's advisors. Criticism of Mamie Eisenhower mocked for spending time in the morning in bed due to her illness from the archives and her schedules. We know she was holding staff meetings. Now, not every day, but she wasn't just lolling about. The staff were in the room getting directions planned for the day. Um, Nancy Reagan oh, chided for, for cueing her husband during public appearances, for uh, suggesting what he would say as if he did not, not know what to say, being too interfering, uh, arranging his schedule, and of course both Rosalind and Hillary were criticized as essentially being co-presidents and who elected them. You know, too powerful. Uh, and so the thesis I'm exploring is that close friendships can help First Ladies persist and survive and even thrive in office. And so I'm looking at receiving a friend's support and extending support to the friend. So now we get to how you can help me. If you're like me, you come to one of these lectures and, and you're listening and you start thinking, I know, but you don't know this, or I know, here's what you don't know, or you know, you're wrong about that, and let me tell you why. So you will see note cards, large note cards, for you to write things down that you want me to know, that you might not raise as a question, but information that either I have misperceived, or a story you know, or an event that you want me to make sure that I am aware of. So. We've got plenty of note-taking material, and I'll invite you to those. Just put those on the table when you leave, or they may be the topic of your question or your, your comment. But I know you know things, and I want to benefit from what you know. Moving on to Hillary and, and Diane. They were friends for 40 years. They met in Fayetteville when Hillary relocated to Arkansas from Washington. And back then, she had more contact and first knew Jim Blair because he was a fellow law school uh, professor. And they were tennis partners. They even competed in a few tournaments. Yes, 
Yes, Jim and Hillary. And then as Jim started uh, dating Diane, and of course, as Hillary circulated more in the Fayetteville community, if you're a Democrat, you would have run into Diane. And so uh, over time, uh, Diane uh, was really the, the senior friend because she helped acculturate Hillary to the Arkansas environment, to the U.S. system, to uh, campaigning in Arkansas. And um, actually, Diane had known Bill first because he started dropping by uh, the university to visit with Diane when he helped on McGovern's campaign down in Texas. So there's a, a long relationship that ties these four people, the two Clintons and the two Blairs, together. Uh, Diane helped Hillary in so many ways. Diane ran a book club. If you're in a book club, you know the joy of talking about ideas with friends. And uh, once Hillary was no longer nearby, Diane sent her book after book with advice. You need to read this. And of course, Hillary sent Diane books. And so this 40 years of an intellectual dialogue, not just about politics, friendship, sharing ideas and what those mean, and of course, Diane had an incredible network of political contacts. And so here we see uh, Hillary and Diane early from Arkansas days, and then much later, you can tell how much later, by uh, Bill. <laughs> and because you know Hillary, I feel no need to introduce Hillary. Um, and let me just mention one more thing about Diane, and that is her expertise on Arkansas politics. Uh, the articles she has written about Arkansas governors, uh, the books, her book on Arkansas politics, it, both the first edition and the second one uh, with uh, Jay Barth, uh, pu published posthumously. Uh, they are what we know about Arkansas politics at incredible references. So Diane was not just a knowledgeable friend, a uh, party activist. She was also quite the professor of Arkansas politics. So what did these people do as, as friends? Um, they celebrated things like the birth and, 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 and family. Uh, so that's, that's Diane and Hillary and Chelsea. They celebrated all sorts of occasions, uh, and I will uh, show you some of the birthday party announcements that I found in the archives. And this uh, just photo is the Blairs and the Clintons back then. So researching a friendship, what do you do, how do you do it? Well, you go to the archives. Fortunately for all of us, Jim Blair donated all of Diane's files, her, her Arkansas government course files, her uh, correspondence files, her photos. If it was anywhere near Diane's desk, it is in the archives. So I just want to make special mention of the special collections at UA Fayetteville's Mullins Library, the archivist who processed all of these documents and who support everyone's research there. And I want to also mention the financial support my research received from my university. Um, every, every little bit helps us travel to that research collection. So what's in it? This is just an outline of the materials. Um, and so uh, Diane's research papers. If it's an Arkansas topic, she has a file on it. And newspaper clippings from papers throughout the states, and her notes and interviews and technical reports. Um, I won't go through each one, I'll just, because we'd never finish, but I'll just mention that most of my presentation is based on the correspondence files and the files from the presidential years to get a sense of what kind of photographic materials are available. I know this is too small for you to see, and if you want 
the, the file. I'll send it to you. But just to give you a sense, this is a partial list that document friendship activities. It's not just a list. We can code it. These are friendship activities. Uh, being invited to the inauguration with a multi-page, point-by-point diary of what it was like, where we went, staying in the White House, being there after the inauguration, and then the next day. So incredible uh, resource. Staying in the White House on other sorts of occasions, normal friends activities like playing cards, celebrating Christmases and birthdays, hosting the Clintons at the Blair's Lake House. Uh, that's where Chelsea learned to water ski. And that's also a place where the Clintons could be Clintons in some privacy and do the sorts of things friends do. Bill and Diane racing to see who completed the New York Times Sunday crossword puzzle first. And they'd fax these back and forth when they couldn't be together. This was an ongoing routine. Uh, here, for example, this is a, it's a, oh, you may not recognize. This is a record, a, 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 a record player record. And it's the invitation for a birthday party. Uh, this is an invitation to a surprise. Did you know Hillary likes to dance? She does. So there was a square dance party uh, that Diane helped organize and, of course, participated in. And yes, that's uh, young Hillary. And you know, make it a surprise. So what I want to get into in more detail, because this shows how a social scientist uh, answers a question and documents how the relationship works with respect to a particular role um, responding to negative media and being an advocate for the Clintons and also a defender. Now, I know that it's going to sound like I only talk about the nice stuff. I thought this evening it would be nice to look at a political figure through their best friend's eyes. This is a side of, of the Clintons we don't normally see, and it may be a side that you did not know. Um, so it's not that I'm unaware of a variety of negative things. It's that when we're looking at the supportive relationship and how to not just survive the White House but thrive, how might a friend help you do that? So one of, one of Diane's roles in the relationship back during the presidential campaign that also continued on into the, the presidential years was being a response agent because so much criticism at that time focused on Arkansas. Now, who knew Arkansas better than Diane? Of course. So part of her job was making a rapid response to a political problem, doing political advocacy through her wide network, and personal support in the form of sending positive uh, information about good things that might be happening. So I'm trying to illustrate uh, one side of the role. Jim Blair described this role as being the fire extinguisher or the counterinsurgency research strategy. Diane herself said, it was my job to catch the grenades being hurled in nonstop from all sides and then toss them back out again before they exploded in Bill Clinton's face. I know how necessary it was to keep them from ever scoring a fatal hit on Bill or Hillary. And I guess I was uniquely qualified to do it. So this is a detailed example. I'm going to move through it pretty quickly so that we don't bog down, so that we have time to talk. So this is just one of many events. Uh, the trigger event is publication on July 31st in 1994 of a long article. I printed it out. It is 23 pages of a good size font, a uh, good size font, uh, in the, uh, New York, uh, the New York Times Sunday Magazine. The piece is partly a synthesis of published reports on the Arkansas years, reviews of biographies about the Clintons, many pages of evidence for Diane to dissect, confirm, and or refute. 
And in fact, many of Kelly's comments were quite positive, but you know how life is. It's the negative stuff that tends to stick with us. The positive stuff kind of goes, yeah, 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 we all know that, but the negative stuff. So I'll just mention two. Uh, Kelly wrote, the 42nd president is an impressive thinker, a talented political performer, and something of a visionary. The president's problems did not come about because he's a cheap political hack. They came about because he was not. He wanted more than anything in life to get where he is today in order to do good. I mean, wouldn't you like somebody to write that about you? Uh, yeah. But... Kelly also inventoried and detailed the political compromises. Uh, that is, that's how politics works when things get done. Uh, scandals, controversies, and his explanation for those got quite personal. A disunity of character. That Clinton is a brilliant young man who has not quite arrived at a clear understanding of himself. And that in public opinion, there is a level of mistrust, even dislike of him, that is almost visceral in its intensity, of which we are well aware. So here's an article that is a lot of facts, a lot of positive, a lot of negative, and Diane is propelled into action. So. Imagine being in the White House, reading about your lives, not only in Kelly's long article, but the intense feeding frenzy in media coverage of the article that continued for days. So we come to several days later, uh, and here we're going to sort of pause to sink into the evidence. This uh, sent Sunday, August 14th, 1994, uh, so July 31st, the publication, August 14th, Diane is responding to Hillary's request that she, as an Arkansas expert, compile evidence to refute some items that Hillary felt were inaccurate, false, out of context. And within days, Diane responds. So let's look, let's read and look for elements of support. This is a cover to a package that was faxed. So the first thing I noticed was, well, she sent a prepared text of here's a draft response. Uh, she suggests a political marketing take on how to use the text and these authors, uh, Phyllis Johnston and, and Hillary and Diane, a promise of more help to come and call me, here's my schedule. Call me is helpful. Here's my schedule, really helpful. Uh, so, document two, Hillary writes to President Clinton, she reached out to Bill the next day. She had already spoken with him by phone. She's coordinating with others, letting him know, sort of sit rep, situation report, we're on this. She's coordinating with others, and she's reporting on her call to David Moranis. He was in the uh, process of writing his biography of Clinton. And so this is a promise of, you will not be defined by Michael Kelly. There are many things coming. And by the way, you haven't granted him an interview. Don't you think it would be helpful to sit down with him and perhaps uh, t talk? and give your side of things. And part of this is timing, part of this is, you know, Diane trying to network and negotiate, but reaching out also to Bill. And this says, uh, this is for Hillary, faxed again as just discussed. They've been on the phone. Um, Adding Norm Ornstein, if you're a political scientist, you know the congressional scholar and often commentator Norm Ornstein, who had just written something that he had faxed a copy of to Diane Blair, who is now letting Bill know this is, this is on the way, out into publication. So in a way, she is um, a communications channel, a funnel. She's, she, slurping up is not a technical term. You'll think of a better one. She is, she is gathering, you know, through her context, what's going on, sort of like a battle damage assessment and a prospect assessment, and letting the Clintons know what's coming. Another one to President Clinton. This is August 17th. This is bolstering your friends by giving them uh, the other side 
that they may not be aware of. And this is a three part, I've got three parts of the document. Um, I'll just um, give you a summary and I really will send you the PowerPoint if you want it. Diane reinforces the positive. She details forthcoming publications, current publications, especially those by Arkansas journalists. You will see names here. Jean Lyons is named here, Ernie Dumas. Um, she should mention, you know, more, but this is just, um, uh, just a few, and how she is continuing to network and advocate for the Clintons. Um, she's reached out to both uh, Senators Pryor and Bumpers, uh, talked to Roy Reed, uh, and trying to develop a set of talking points of where Kelly's going wrong and what is the alternative, I almost said alternative facts. <laughs> the other evidence that might be brought to bear. Uh, and, and so I, I stick to the script, stick to the script, behave yourself. Uh, and about all the letters and calls that she is getting that indicate that people realize that there is more to the story uh, and holding out uh, this sense that there's more out there than you're seeing. And so moving on to David Pryor. Uh, Dear David, the, dra the text attached is my draft. And this one is Roy Reed and Diane coming up with, you know, something that could be used as a research document for writing an op-ed. It's so much easier to get important people to write for you when you send them the research help they need. Ammunition. Uh, and, and so here, not just uh, letting Senator Pryor know, if you need me, here's my phone number. You don't have to look it up. It's right here. And same for Roy Reed. And then uh, final document, almost. Uh, Diane was tempted to write a letter to the New York Times, an ed editorial, you know, a letter to the editor. She did not send it in, but she did send a copy to Hillary, so Hillary would know what Diane would have said and what people would have read in the New York Times. Now, I don't want you to think that archival research is just fun. It is. It's so exciting. You open the box, you take out the folder, you open the folder, you don't know what you're going to see. It is, there's nothing like it. And then you come across something like this. This is evidence of Diane's method, making the list. You know, this is the data dump onto a piece of paper, things I need to do. Unfortunately, even though her writing is clear, you just try Bill Clinton's writing. But she also uses shorthand, and some shorthand that even shorthand people don't recognize because they're Diane's abbreviations. I have my mother's old Greg. <coughs> Greek shorthand book, and I'm a working on it. I'm a working on it. Here's, here's another. This is mostly writing, writing. So this is a better example for you to see how Diane goes into operation with her to-do list. And, and, and just another one. And how about E.J. Dion? How about getting in contact with Doris, Doris Kearns Goodwin? How about Dick Neustadt, the presidential scholar? Uh, how about James David Barber, the presidential scholar? Let's get people involved. She had contacts. So just to look into other kinds of, rip, of support, and we're concluding here. What else Diane offered? So much of uh, our relationships are marked by rituals, the rituals of a normal life, whether it's a vacation, an ongoing intellectual conversation, um, injecting humor into our friend's life through cards, cartoons that balance out the critical, visiting, and Hil uh, Diane and Hillary would go on walks in Washington. There's a photo in the archives of the two of them in the most horrible light pink pantsuits. It's like the Golden Girls are loose on the streets, and they've got on sunglasses and baseball caps, identical pink jogging outfits, and complete camouflage. And 
the normal things of life. And celebrations like those birthday parties, uh, also, you know, the political advocacy, uh, but especially those rituals. Well, what did Hillary offer Diane? This is, after all, a relationship. Can you imagine being a political scientist and working so closely with Hillary? There are two projects that um, got started uh, and have not been completed. One, uh, and there are some notes in the files, a study of First Lady staff, how you organize the staff, who you recruit, what you need staff for, and oral history style interviews of, of those, those persons. Um, a, another uh, project, and this is why Diane well, Diane would have taken copious notes anyway, but this is why she really took copious notes of everything she did, was the, to, to have a, a book about the first year and the many roles of being a first lady, being a mother, being a daughter, ha ailing parents, um, ma managing your image, public policy, uh, traditional first lady roles like the Easter egg hunt, um, and just how you balance all that because we've got Hillary's schedules, we've got so much information that Diane collected. So in a way, Hillary provided a meaningful purpose for Diane's expertise. Uh, many times we, we academics, um, we do our work and it, it sees little light, um, but moving into this more direct action kind of realm, um, Diane was able to use her expertise uh, in a way that had she not had this relationship, she would not have been able to do. Opening the White House uh, to the Blairs, they, they visited Washington many times. So there were, you know, the inauguration visits, celebrations. She hosted a baby shower for Diane's stepdaughter. Can you imagine having your baby shower in the White House? Uh, and, of course, upon Diane's diagnosis of lung cancer, Hillary called her every day, every day. So summing up and moving to uh, your uh, comments and questions, I think that knowing about this friendship points toward understanding how all women in whatever work they do need friends to thrive and survive, and particularly how a first lady uh, might thrive in office with the benefit of just one of many friends. Given the toll that holding this office unavoidably takes on a first lady's well-being, a first lady can provide vital support, and viewing Hillary through Diane's contemporaneous records, written at the time, uh, May shows us a side of Hillary that we were that was not apparent in the news or even in the detailed biographies. It shows us Hillary through her best friend's eyes and Diane through the eyes of Hillary. So now it's your turn. Uh, inviting your comments, inviting your questions, and remember you can write it down if you don't want to say it out loud. That sounds just like a professor to write it down. But goodness gracious, what a great resource, what a great program. And not only is she great at UA Little Rock, she's great at Arkansas Governor School where she teaches as well, so. All right, questions uh, for Dr. Scranton. Surely in this crowd, you know, there have got to be some questions. Yes, here's one. Good here, Chelsea. We can count the Clint School students. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chelsea Miller, and I'm a first year student here Hi. at the Clinton School. Um, my question: I'm going to be doing my capstone on this idea of how women can support other women, and as a woman who's looking to run for public office. So now, in the age of Twitter and social media and all of this, these things, if Looking back to the future with them, what can we do moving forward to help better support women, not just who are running for office, but who are maybe being first lady at all levels of office? Well, the first thing I'd mention is what the Clinton School is doing with the workshops to be offered by the Clinton School students. The skill building professional development workshops. Would you say a word? Well, I would just say that that is uh, the work of Hillary Trudell and Christy Standifer that they are uh, leading these various workshops so that people, not all people, 
uh, can uh, can better uh, adapt, learn, and, and maintain skill sets. We're using Clinton School students and Clinton School alumni to do that. So. But, but, but Chelsea, you know, she, keep an eye on her, Peggy. She probably is going to run for office. Well, and I'd also mention um, there's so much material in the Clinton Library archives about women and girls. Um, who will ever forget uh, when Hillary spoke in Beijing? You know, human rights are women's rights. And her work for, you know, economic development something that's not as well known. When she, in the State Department as Secretary of State, she started a program to cultivate uh, women both in the Foreign Service and being able to apply, you know, getting ready, prepared for, uh, she worked also with Madeleine Albright on this. So there, there are so many things that women can hand on. Yeah. Men the mentorship role, the mentorship role. Mm -hmm. But, but call me, call me, we'll talk. Ruth, well behind you right there. I just heard on the radio this week um, a statement was about Trump and, and they said it's hard to make friends once you're in office. And so that you may not know this, but I'm curious if you are aware of Hillary's friends that she actually made after they went to the White House. She can't answer that. Ann McCoy can. Where are you? Absolutely. Let Ann. Yeah. I think that we want to talk about sets of networks. Um, for, first, there's Hillary Land and her staff, many of whom continue to work with and for her and be on call after the White House years. Uh, the network of professional women in government, uh, whether it's Madeleine Albright or any of the many women in executive positions, Bill Clinton appointed more women to high-level positions than had served before. So there was an automatic sort of pool of persons. The kind of deep best friend uh, typically comes from previous decades, people who have weathered with you. Uh, but if, if, if Anne would like, if Anne, well, when she comes in, you'll notice and we'll ask. No, so, so thank you. Thank you for that. But it is hard to, it's hard to make t friends. I think uh, everyone who's in a position of authority uh, or even just seems important to other people, there's always the risk, are you, are you my friend because I can give you something, or you need me, or are you my friend, friend? So I think just exponentially, you know, the impact of that. And for their children, too. Hard, hard. Other questions? Peggy, one of the things that, that Diane did um, at the end of the 92 campaign, right as it was coming to an end, she took her portable tape recorder yes. and she did all these staff interviews, not, I mean, just right there on the spot. Some of those uh, have been released uh, through the University of Arkansas. Uh, did, did any of that information indicate about her role with Hillary, our friendship, or the people that were working, to, did that? I have not gone through those yet. They are high on my bucket list okay. of things okay. to do. The, um, there are also, Jim Blair has done a long uh, oral history style interview for Frontline. Um, and so they're just, there's so, there's so much out there. There's just so much. Any other questions? Yes, right here, Joe. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I've also looked at the Blair papers, more actually for Blair herself, just her role, but I was very interested um, in the Renaissance program and how, just which I had not the Renaissance Weekend? Yes, and how the um, 
the Blairs and the Clintons and many other people participated in that. And I wonder if you could speak to that a bit and how people structured national relationships, what it was and how people structured basically national networks around it. I'd mention that one, and I'd also mention the National Governors Association. For Hillary did presentations for incoming governors' wives, but that was a an idea, idea network. The the New Democrat uh, meetings, where the philosophy of being a new a new Democrat, that was another set of political networks. The Renaissance weekends, gosh, has anybody? Been, I have never been. Has anybody been? They're part the East Coast political elite, some celebrities. There is a program of activities, a little bit like the Chautauqua courses, where there are a series of speakers and then people socialize with the speaker and talk a little bit like the series that the Clinton School puts on, for which we are incredibly grateful. But um, these are, it's a residential happening, I mean, to use a sort of a 60s word. Uh, it's meet and greet, it's network. I mean, Vernon Jordan would be there. Um, uh, f financial people, uh, Soros, you know, kinds of people. So if you, if you think of, it's a little bit like the Clinton Global Initiative Without the pol without being policy and donor matchup, it's more of a let's all talk about what people are talking about, and let's see how we can interface and network. Um, but the Clintons were both masters of let me connect. I am more, I am more powerful as part of an organization. I am more powerful through my friends. I am more powerful if I go places and listen. You know, it's interesting, and then, then I'll let everybody go, but you, you brought this story of, of Hillary and, 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 and Diane Blair. But it would also be interesting, and I look at my friend Brooke Bumpers here, it would also be interesting for someone to do a study of Jeanette Rockefeller and her friends and Betty Bumpers and her friends and Barbara Pryor and the people that influenced gay whites of the world, that the Janet Huckabees of the yes. world, Susan Hutchinson's of the world, to who they turn to and what kind of friendship they have for the support base. We just, I mean, Hillary happened to, you know, go to the White House, but a lot of these other women are also making monumental differences. And it'd be interesting to see who they turn to uh, in times of, of both opportunity and challenge. That might be a and great research project. Increasingly, first ladies have papers that can be donated to archives, not just okay. the governor's well, here we spot, wow. And here we go. All it takes is journalists. Here's Sylvia. It didn't take her long to be spurred on. Are you going to do that research project that I just laid out? No, I just wanted to uh, make a comment. I heard uh, Nikki Haley interviewed uh, within the last week, who was the governor of South Carolina and is now the UN ambassador. And she attributed Hillary Clinton with getting her into politics and getting her involved in politics. Wrong party for Nikki, but, <laughs> but I thought it was very interesting. And she had uh, a high praise for Hillary Clinton. Thank you. Nobody has a Hillary story to share, to take us out on. My name's Catherine Street, and I was a student of, of Diane's. Um, and I was also a good friend of her research assistant, so I spent quite a bit of time in her office and also in the Blair guest house. Um, and Diane was a force of nature. And I think being the professor teaching um, Arkansas politics, the comment about Nikki Haley being inspired by Hillary Clinton, I think there are vast numbers of people involved at all levels of Arkansas politics, and with the Clintons having gone to the White House, national politics, who were inspired by Diane. She was, she was amazing. So I'm, I was thrilled to see that this, this program was on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everybody, thank you all Thank for you. coming. Let's give Peggy Stan the big one.